Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 358. What are you complaining about? You got a check. Most filmmakers don't even get a check. Predatory film distributor. (laughs) Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by FilmTools.com. Since 1996, Film Tools has been Hollywood's one-stop shop for all things production. No matter what your filmmaking needs, Film Tools has you covered when you need gear for your next shoot. Anytime I need anything really quickly, I go to Film Tools. They always have every single kind of production nugget and thing that I might need, no matter how small or big it is. They definitely have it. And this week, Film Tools is offering the Indie Film Hustle Tribe 5% off all purchases at filmtools.com. Just use the coupon code IFHPOD. That's IFHPOD at the checkout at filmtools.com. The show is also sponsored by my new book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money Making Business. In it, I discuss how to actually create the film entrepreneur model and how to make money with your film or films and do it again and again so you can actually build a successful career and business. So if you want to pre-order the book, head over to filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. Now, today on the show, guys, we have a legend in the film distribution space. His name is Peter Broderick. And he wrote an article back in 2009 coining the phrase hybrid distribution. Now, what the hell is hybrid distribution? Hybrid distribution is the -the state-of-the-art model more and more filmmakers are using to succeed. It enables them to have unprecedented access to audiences to maintain overall control of their distribution and receive a significantly larger share of the revenues. Now, Peter is a champion for independent filmmakers. He's been doing this for quite some time. And I wanted to bring him on the show not only to dig into hybrid distribution, but he also wrote a very, very informative article about how to deal with a distributor going out of business, how to protect yourself from something like that, as well as digging a little bit deeper in how to protect yourselves and what to do next if you are caught up in this distributor debacle. And Peter is a wealth of information, and we sat down, and the interview just kept going, guys. It just kept going. We had, It was just like two guys sitting around talking about how to make money in this business, and it, I think it goes over an hour and a half, so it is an epic episode, but man, are there a lot of golden nuggets, a lot of knowledge bombs in this episode. So prepare yourself to get your mind blown, take some notes. And enjoy my conversation with Peter Broderick. I'd like to welcome to the show Peter Broderick. Thank you so much for being on the show, Peter. Thanks for having me, Alex. I, I appreciate it. You are uh, you are a, uh, a legend in, in many ways in our industry, and, and especially in the distribution realm. So I've I've heard your name fly around for years and years and years, and uh, it has taken this disaster called Distributor to bring us together finally. There you go. <laughs> So how do we knew. exactly? Well, I mean, you know what? To be honest with you, this whole this, and we're going to get into the whole distributor thing. But this this debacle and this this uh, situation it has brought a lot of filmmakers together and a lot of people together uh, in a way that I don't think uh, this this kind of tragedy would have wouldn't have been able to would would not, there would be no other way to do it. it and sometimes it takes a tragedy or it takes you know, an explosive situation to actually galvanize a community and put them, you know, get them together. Would you agree on that? I totally agree. I think that sometimes when I'm speaking and let's say I'm looking at 200 independent filmmakers and I think about how atomized their experience and information is, they're not sharing it with each other. And I think if we could just figure out ways to share how much more powerful everybody will be. And so in the distributor situation, you know, with the Facebook um, page, that's happening in a, in, a, in, a, in a great way. And so I hope there'll be more of that to come. So before we get deeper, in, deeper into the distributor situation, uh, how did you get into the business? Can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your, and, and your history in the business? 
Well, it's, uh, <laughs> there's, there's, there's many chapters, but I'll just do the haiku version. For sure. So <clears throat> in a former life, I was um, working as a public defender in D.C., uh, and then after three years, I decided uh, I had um, I, I needed to find another um, happier line of work. So you jumped into the lucrative <laughs> the lucrative world of filmmaking. <laughs> well, lucrative. It wasn't about lucra- lucrativeness. It was about passion. And um, Good. I <clears throat> came to Los Angeles. I was still living in in D- D.C. I did 55 interviews in five and a half weeks. I mean, meetings, you could say, not interviews. And then uh, on a fateful Friday afternoon, I got three job offers in two hours and met with the people on Monday and then started working for Terry Malick on Tuesday. Um, (laughs) So, (laughs) and the the Days of Heaven uh, was in um, post-production. And so they were going to do some additional shooting. So he asked me to organize that. And then I, I was living out of a suitcase with seven days worth of clothes. Um, all my stuff was in Washington for months. And then eventually I got to go back and, you know, drive out here with, with everything. And then uh, I worked for Terry for f- four years. In the second part of that time, we did the initial shooting for what became Tree of Life. And Terry put the footage in, this, in a, literally in a refrigerator um, and then, like 30 years later, um, thought it out, and uh, it's actually in Tree of Life, which is <laughs> kind of remarkable. And, and only Terry would would think of that and and make it work. <clears throat> so I, and then so um, I stopped working for Terry. Uh, then I started consulting for various foundations about uses of new technology related to film. Um, then, uh, I got on the board of what was then called IFP West, um, now called Film Independent. And I wrote a series of articles about ultra low budget filmmaking. Uh, so it was Clerks, El Mariachi, a number of other films. And it was really about how you can work backwards from resources that are available to you and then write a script that can be made with resources you already have. So you're not chasing money endlessly. Um, And we printed the budgets, which is a kind of, as you know, revolutionary act to print a real budget. (laughs) And and those articles, they're they're still on my, they're still connected on my website, um, peterbroderick.com, had a really big impact. And so more and more filmmakers, not just across the US, but around the world started making ultra low budget features. And um, it, was a, it was just amazing that people weren't, you know, spending forever um, chasing the permission to make a movie. They could go out and make it. You, but when you brought this idea of backing into or backing into a movie script or backing into the idea of, of, of uh, to try to make a feature film, d- there was nobody who said that prior to that. Or at least there wasn't no. – it wasn't out there in, in, in the, uh, in the <laughs> no, zeitgeist. In the- in the mid '80s, there was a lot of money that came from home video, mm. so it wasn't that hard to find a million dollars to make a first feature. By the by, the late '80s, <laughs> um, the bloom was off the video store rose, and the shelves were full, and so you couldn't you couldn't find that million dollars anymore. So then these filmmakers started to do it another way, and I think what what was so exciting about it was the idea that they didn't need permission. They just needed to be smart about resources and write something that could be done with what they had. So in the case of El Mariachi, Robert Rodriguez had a gun, a school bus, and a dog. They're prominently featured in the film. Kevin Smith was working at a quick stop, knew that at night nobody was using it. So he could set it. And it's, the funny thing about clerks is that there's this running gag when they come into the store and the blinds aren't up. The shutters aren't up, and that's because right. it's night outside, and <laughs> you'd realize that. Um, so, so that was exciting. And then one day I was having um, a meeting with someone who was on the board of um, IFU West, and he asked me what I was 
um, what I was interested in doing. And he had evidently had a long lunch and was being very sleepy in the meeting. And finally, well, he kind of wakes up and he says, and what else? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So I said, well, I'm interested in starting a finishing fund for ultra low budget films because everybody's running out of money and, and, you know, so he goes, I'll help you do it. So over the next year, he helped me write a business plan. Then, um, when the business plan was finished, I kind of assumed, okay, now we have a business plan. Now the money's going to show up. (laughs) (laughs) True. So uh, there's two quick stories. Um, I was on the West coast and, uh, there was a guy who was head of a record label and we went to him and told him about the idea. And he loved the idea of giving filmmakers, you know, their chance to, to start their careers. And it was a great meeting. And then a few days later, I found out that he was in a divorce fight with his wife. All his assets were frozen. And last I heard he was in rehab and that obviously went away completely. Right. Then I was in Washington, D.C. and I ended up in this room with these rich guys. And I was telling them about this idea of a finishing fund. Well, they didn't know what independent film really was. They weren't quite sure how a finishing fund worked. So I go outside in the hallway, and the number two, the number one guy in the firm was traveling. The number two guy comes up to me and he says, we hear a lot of pitches, but we think you know how, how to make us money. Well, I was, I, was, I was glad that's what he thought. I wasn't convinced it was a money-making operation, but if he believed that that was all good. So then I went back to Los Angeles, and he called me, and he said, number one guy's back in town. And he'd like to see some examples of these independent films. So obviously, you know, that's a trick question. If you send them the films that you like, they might run screaming from the room. And if you send, and if, if you don't do that, maybe when it comes time to finance a movie, they're going to not be interested in what you want to do. Um, anyway, so I sent him El Mariachi, Clerks. Um, she's got to have it. And... Uh, he got them on a Friday and on a Monday, the number two guy calls me and says, number one guy, watch some of those films you sent. And there's a little pause. And then he says, he never wants to be involved in any way, (laughs) which which I thought was a pretty definitive no. Um, and better, better to have it than, than have, you know, be in business with him or them. So that, they went away. So okay. then um, IFC, um, the Independent Film Channel, uh, IFC Films, um, heard about it, and they were interested because they were financing features by more ex- experienced indies, mm-hmm. and they loved the idea of you know people just starting out. So Next Wave Films uh, came together um, really, really quickly, and we had an advisory board of these Fabulous directors from around the world, um, George Miller in Australia, Peter Jackson in um, <clears throat> New Zealand. Small uh, guys, small guys, yeah. And Stephen Frears, everybody just said yes, because they loved the idea of giving folks a chance. And so we started, and um, the second film we did was a film called Following, which was Chris Nolan's first feature. Mm-hmm. And that was, <clears throat> that was a really fortuitous thing. I went to a panel. Chris was on the panel. I'd never heard of Chris before. <clears throat> and he said he had he was making this film. So afterwards, I went up to him. And I, I wasn't even thinking about finishing funds. I was just interested. And he said, okay. And so he gave me um, a cassette. Five minutes in, I'm like, this guy's got it. There's just no question. <laughs> Whatever it is, he's got it. <laughs> and so we gave, them, we gave him finishing funds. Um, Took the film to the Toronto Film Festival, where it did really well. Then it won the Rotterdam Film Festival, and then Chris was off to the races. It, you know, <clears throat> Zeitgeist distributed it. It got great reviews, and it gave him the opportunity to get funding for Memento, and you know, on from there. But the film cost twelve thousand um, dollars. Shot in sixteen, the whole crew could fit in an elevator, um, and it's a remarkable movie, I think, still. So that was a great, great story because. Really, what we want to do is not just help a filmmaker finish a movie and find distribution, but also help him or her launch their career. 
Um, so, so you have a very uh, you have a, a a a long past in this business, <laughs> long and you've past. you've got some shrapnel. Uh, I I feel that you have some shrapnel uh, and some scarring, uh, without question, from this business. Well, I I feel lucky, uh, mm-hmm. really. I mean, the chance to work with Terry. Um, yeah, that's you know, not a bad first job. That's not a ama- bad first job. Amazing, and then. You know, with the finishing fund, you know, we were kind of <clears throat> in new territory, finding you know exceptional filmmakers and films. We did a we did a digital um, arm called Agenda Two Thousand, which was to give money to finance digital features. We were the first um, company to, that was able to do that. Um, so I just I just feel you know lucky to have <clears throat> have these opportunities, and then. When, um, well, okay, so the next next thing that happened, I went to Cannes, it was 98, um, and I saw um, the celebration and the idiots, both mm-hmm. shot on mm-hmm. cameras designed to take pictures of babies' first steps and show them on the living room television. And here, world's most prestigious film festival, they're on the giant screen in the Palais. I'm like, this is, this is a revolution right here. And so I came back to the U.S., and... I was talking to my team and they said, why don't we create a presentation and then take it to festivals and show people what's going on? So we did that and we took it to <clears throat> Sundance, Toronto, Cannes, Rio, many places. And at first people thought we'd lost our minds, that it was filmed forever and whatever. And then all of a sudden, within six months, in terms of submissions to the finishing fund, we saw the change. And um, Kodak, which... Uh, I'd been very friendly with, they had thought about financing the finishing fund initially, but they only wanted to finance one movie. And I said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to let the success or failure of this depend on the success of one film. But it was too risky for them in their own minds to do more than one. Anyway, so then they, Kodak decided I was the devil <laughs> because I was talking about digital filmmaking. And I said, well, no, I, I think Kodak's great, but I think you should reposition yourself as the image company. It's not about uh, film. It's not about digital. You do the best images, whatever, however people want to work. But that they couldn't, they couldn't they, turn the no. ship. Mm-mm. The iceberg was out there and waiting. Um, <clears throat> so, anyways, uh, um, then um, in um, a few years later, um, Next Wave turned into a pumpkin because IFC didn't want to wait for the back end. We were giving up to a hundred thousand uh, dollars to films, and initially. We would get a hundred thousand dollar advances, and so we could just turn the money around and make it available to someone else. So uh, it turned into a pumpkin um, in late two thousand two, and then some people, and then I went around and talked to people about the state of distribution because I'd been involved in finding distribution for all the films that we fi- uh, gave finishing funds to, and I found this new thing starting up, um, this kind of alternative approach to distribution that was really exciting and at the same time a few people called me and said you know could I help them figure out their distribution um and so I said okay I'll try and then another person came another person came and since then that was late 2002 I've I've consulted on over 1500 movies um and the thing that's been lucky there is that I've been by the side of the, these filmmakers as they've been out on the frontiers. Mm-hmm. And so I can share the lessons they've learned, good and bad, with other people I work with or people I speak to or people that read my distribution bulletin. So it's, um, it's such an exciting time. Things are changing every 20 minutes, as you know. And um, so I... The, I wrote this piece called Welcome to the New World of Distribution in 2008, which even though it's 11 years later, still, it's not only still true today, but it's more true than it ever was. It's still fairly revolutionary today, which is, which is shocking. <laughs> right, right. So I really, I really am excited about this idea of these new possibilities that are open to filmmakers, the possibility of splitting your rights, the possibility of having more control of your distribution. Um, I think that making a traditional all rights deal should be plan C. Um, I don't know what plan B is, but plan A is splitting your rights. And that's what I call hybrid distribution, 
which means it's not self-distribution. You're working with different distributors to do the things they're good at and only the things they're good at, not giving all rights to somebody where they don't care about some of the rights and they're horrible at others. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And retaining the rights to do things yourself, which um, are going to make a big difference. So the combination of what they can do for you and what you can do on your own, the idea that you can have overall control of your distribution instead of, you know, giving all that control to a distributor um, is very exciting. And, And in this new world, I think every film needs a customized distribution strategy. Mm-hmm. Not not a formulaic approach. There was a, cu- a couple of years ago, I was invited to a major Hollywood agency and they asked me to talk to them about the future of distribution. And I walk in the room and I say, <clears throat> think of a spectrum of distribution from formulaic on the one end, where every film is distributed pretty much the same way, to customized on the other, where each film has its own strategy based on its goals, its core audiences. The room gets visibly upset in 10 seconds. I'm like, what's wrong? They go, um, we don't do customized. So I say, well, <clears throat> you don't need to do customized. It just works better. They go, we don't do customized. We're not set up to do customized. We don't do customized. Right. Kind of went downhill from there. But, <laughs> but in, in, their, in their defense, they admitted they don't do customized. Whereas... You look at the you know major indie distributors now who kind of claim. I mean, and there are examples. I mean, sometimes the Fox Searchlight, you know, whatever. But um, mostly, it's throw it against the wall and see if it sticks. If it sticks, the distributor will support it some more. If it doesn't stick, they're not going to give you the rights back, um, and they're not going to support it either. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the, from my experience working at distribution for as many years as I have as well, first in post-production and now with with Indie Film Hustle, I, I realized that nobody knows anything, first of all. That's that's very true. Like, nobody really understands anything in, in regards to distribution because, like you said, it is changing every 20 minutes. What was true last year in TVOD is no longer true this year and right. vice versa. And then there's also brand new revenue streams coming in all the time, right. new platforms, new situations, new options like Tug was never a thing before where you could do on-demand screenings. And remember when DVD was the savior and when VHS was the savior and Blu-rays was the savior. Now TVOD used to be, but now AVOD's turning into where a lot of the money is being made in the streaming world. Like there's so many different things. I, you know, I, I find that this the distribution uh, you know, um, infrastructure or the the legacy model of distribution. These guys are built this system basically to to benefit themselves, and that's fine. They're a business, and that's what businesses do. But like you just said, perfect example is uh, well, you got to customize. Oh, we don't customize. They're completely closed off, and these kind of finite mentalities is where. They're not going to make it in the long term, as Blockbuster proved, as Kodak proved, as so many companies that we've seen has has proven in case in case. Again, there are new little startups coming up that are shaking up things. I mean, Netflix was a nobody, and they literally transformed the entire industry. Well, it's interesting, uh, the juxtaposition of my experience with Kodak and my experience with Netflix. A, A couple, I don't know, eight years ago. Ten years ago, mm-hmm. I was doing a one-on-one discussion with Ted Sarandos at some festival somewhere, and um, so in the middle of the discussion, uh, I asked him if he'd read a book called *The Innovator's Dilemma*. Mm-hmm. And he looks at me like, "Has somebody be somebody from inside Netflix telling me?" Because it turned out everybody at Netflix was reading that book and thinking about how it applied to what Netflix's choices were going forward. And the book is about how a a new entrant in an industry that's using newer technologies challenges, you know, the company that's dominant and what that company should do. Um, anyways, so obviously at that point they were still red envelopes. Um, and, but thinking digitally and thinking forward, I think the challenge for a lot of indie distributors is that they're, they keep looking backwards they keep looking for the, for that hit again that they had five years ago. 
but that the th things have changed and and they're not looking it's not just that they're not looking forwards they're not even looking around at what's going on today so they're losing opportunities a, a great example of that is the film Keddie the documentary it's about seven cats in Istanbul okay so the filmmaker is Turkish. She, when she grew up, she had like 22 cats in her backyard, and now she's living in L.A. And she said, "Going to make a documentary about cats in Istanbul because they're like, they're not like, there's not house cats and wild cats. They're just cats, and like in you know, they're sacred cows in India. They're in a whole elevated status. So she goes to goes to Istanbul, films the story of seven cats, and then. Uh, takes it to film festivals because she wasn't in Sundance. Um, it didn't get seen there um, because the distributors that they showed the movie to didn't have comps on cat movies. Um, <laughs> seriously. No, no. I mean, um, it's, it's funny, and, but it's true. And, and also the reps wouldn't do it because they didn't have comps on cat movies either. So finally a oscilloscope calls Seattle, Seattle film festival and says, um, what, what movies broke out this year? And they said, well, we had this movie about cats in Istanbul. We did a screening and we had to do another screening. We, and they ended up doing four sold out screenings. And so oscilloscope watched the movie and they said, okay, let's, let's do it. And, um, they did a great job. The movie opened in New York the first weekend, $41,000 in one theater, which is the most in one theater for any oscilloscope movie ever. And then it went on to make a, a, almost $3 million theatrically. And it was a situation where the fact that 86 million people are watching cat videos online was completely lost to the distributors that <laughs> had a chance to be involved with the movie. Right. When I, and I consulted on the distribution, and when I first um, met with the filmmakers, I said, you're going to be fine. Once you get to digital distribution, you're going to oh, be totally fine. It's going to explode. And I don't, I don't know what will happen with theatrical. Anyways, um, all those other companies missed that that history of what was going on online, and so they passed on a movie. And they're so I think you know that's a that's a case where you can't even see an opportunity in front of you because it doesn't fit your model. Um, and and what I almost I'm almost surprised in terms of these companies. And there's various times, like I remember one year I was at the Toronto Film Festival and I talked to a German distributor and I said, so what new things are you doing? <laughs> he looks at me, new? We're not doing anything new that we haven't done for 10 years. And, and I didn't know whether it was defensive or he was like proud of the fact, but it was just weird to me because even if you were just doing your basic business, mm -hmm. you could still be experimenting around the edges and and trying things out and the things that worked you can do more of and the things that didn't work okay you tried and you don't need to do those again um and so there's a there's a way in which it seems that you know some people are hoping they can retire before they have to change anything um but isn't that and, the way in every industry though like if you're if you're entrenched in the in the, in the executive branches you don't want to talk about something that's going to happen 20 years from now you want to just no. but how about 20 minutes from now <laughs> exactly because things are changing that fast and also i mean think about it we had the music business example Ugh. right the, and the book and like, the book business and the book business right uh, but so it's like it's not that hard to see that things are changing around you and they're going to be in your industry soon. And even when they start to be in your industry, you just ignore them. So I think that what's exciting now is that for the first time, well, for you know, as with digital filmmaking and no budget filmmaking, filmmakers could um, decide to make a movie and make a movie. Nobody could stop them. Right. And now you can decide to do distribution and nobody can stop you and you can make your movie available globally. Now, hopefully, you can find partners who will do pieces of it. Um, but you know, my my view of global distribution for documentaries is that great. Get a sales company on board and uh, give them a year, and say for the first year we'll be good, and we won't sell the movie internationally to consumers. Um, and then after a year, we're going to have the right to sell from our website into unsold territories. So if you sold 15 countries, that leaves 170 countries or 180 countries where nobody has access to our movie, and we're going to be able to sell directly into them. 
And so now you're supplementing or complementing what they do. You're not getting in their way. So ultimately, you have, you have not only access, but a way you know, to reach those audiences. So the challenge is, how do you market online? We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Effectively, globally. And there are a number of filmmakers, some of whom I'm working with, who are, are figuring how to do that. So um, in some cases, they're not re- even relying on sales companies at all. They're selling directly. So I think that you get into a situation where um, if, you, if you can find great distribution partners, great. But even without them, you know, for some films that you can do extremely well. Don't you, don't you agree that, I mean, I've seen it a thousand times uh, with filmmakers, is that we're the only industry that will, will spend a million dollars on a product and have no idea how they're going to get it to the marketplace. They just, they're just artists first and they just put everything they have in it. And then when they walk into a distribution meeting, the distributor has all the power. They have no leverage whatsoever because they're just like, well, I don't know what else to do. Um, this guy or this girl is telling me, oh, I'll be able to do this. And you're, and then the comps come out. I love the comps. Uh, the comps come out. I'm like, oh, we, we estimate that your movie's going to make, you know, X amount here in this territory and that territory, but nobody really knows. And they just give, they literally, I call it a non tax deductible donation to these distributors because am I wrong? And basically that's what it is because you're giving them your movie away for 10 years in hopes that one day you'll get a check and let's not even get into, you know, the practices of these contracts and what goes on behind the scenes and all that kind of stuff. But just on the, on the first, first part of that, that statement, do you, do you find that most filmmakers just don't even think about distribution, let alone who, how they're going to get it to the marketplace? Well, it's not only most filmmakers don't, but most companies don't either. So, you know, major (laughs) studios, they, they don't make, you could, you know, I think you need a strategy. They don't have a strategy. They, they just have a plan. That's like a formula that they use with the other five movies they just did. So, um, you know, what, what I say to filmmakers is the morning they think up the idea for their next film in the shower, that's when I want them to start thinking about core audiences and distribution. Mm -hmm. And there's so much they can do before they've made the movie, while they're making the movie, while they're in post-production to identify those core audiences, to reach out to them, to be, build awareness, not to wait till, you know, the movie's so-called done. So, um, but I think that, you know, studios are just, you know, they're in their own ruts and this is how they do things. Um, occasionally, and there's some examples with Fox Searchlight where they really were smart about, um, how they figured out the core audiences, you know, Napoleon Dynamite is a great example. So the, they buy the movie at Sundance, first feature, they come back to Los Angeles and they sit around and they think about, okay, who should we target? Who's the core audience for the movie? So after some discussion, they decide it's nerds. And their goal is to get every nerd in America to see the movie three times and memorize the dialogue. And so the movie opens, the nerds are there, they're back the second week, they're back the third week, and the fourth week the nerds are there and their parents have shown up. So now you started with a core audience, you've reached the core audience, it's helped you keep your movie in theaters long enough that the audience can diversify from there. Um, Bended like Beckham's another example, so they figured out soccer moms, uh, daughters and an Indian audience. They spread the word before the movie opens. They come out to keep the movie in long enough and then it, it grows. Um, my Big Fat Greek Wedding is an interesting example where first week, you know, Greek Americans were there. The second week, first generation immigrants from all around the world were there because they thought it was their story too. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think if people don't think, I mean, <laughs> the idea that Hollywood talks about audience still in quadrants Older males, younger males, older females. That is the most ridiculous, <laughs> pathetic definition of audience. 18 to and 35 they, demographics, sir. Yeah. Male. And I'm like, okay, my, my, please. Those days are, those days are gone. There's in, in the world of, of geo targeting. And I mean, you could target down to the zip code, let alone interest. Let, I mean, those days are so gone, but because they have all these financial resources and infrastructures in place, the machine can keep running for a little while longer until something else 
comes in. And that's something else at this point was Netflix or the whole concept of streaming, which I mean, how many, when did Netflix start streaming and when did Disney decide to jump in? You know, I mean, it's a a decade, a decade for them to, that's how big of a ship it is for them to move. And I think Disney will do well in in their endeavor. They're one of the few, I think they're one of the few that are actually going to do well. Uh, we could talk about the whole streaming wars thing because I, f- I find it fascinating on where where we're going to go with this, with with this whole thing because Disney Plus I think is going to do very well because they just have everything for that certain kind of audience and then they're going to also include Fox which was a great purchase because now they have the adult version of Disney uh, Fox Searchlight even if I think they're going to keep that going yeah. I think they're keeping that going as well but then you've got Peacock. You know, I don't know how Peacock's going to do. Was it NBC Universal? I mean, um, no, that's that's NBC Universal. Peacock, Comcast, Apple. You know, I, I, man, it's just at a certain point. How many more subscriptions can we we can can we purchase? Right, right. So, what do you think? <laughs> well, I, I think it's you know it's funny because in terms of feature films, um, we're in this uh, the domination of um, franchises and you know and studios. <laughs> I, I wrote a piece that's on my website um, called "The Truth About Hollywood," which is a review of this book. Um, that's an amazing book, and basically the idea that you make a franchise, you know how much the last episode made and how much it cost, <laughs> so you can budget. You, it's not a question of how much the new one will cost because you know, mm-hmm. and you pretty, have a pretty good idea of how much it's going to make. Mm-hmm. And if 75% of the revenue is coming from overseas and you know those franchises are working in China, then why mess around with unique movies? Why mess around with lower budget movies when you can just crank out this assembly line of stuff? Um, so, it's just interesting that then you see what's happened with cable and Netflix and you know, now that now that's where some creativity and risk taking is. It's certainly not in, you know, feature films made by studios anymore. Um, so I think it's, I think it's a, there's hope. (laughs) Um, but I want to make sure that, you know, that, indie theaters can hang in there um, because I think I think that's an important part of the the story um, although I think it's going to be more challenging and this year was a pretty pretty tough year yeah um, and it, it's getting I mean there's only so many look I'm a huge fan of the blockbusters I've you know I've, I was I mean I remember the time when there were no superhero movies and that when ba- that's why when Batman showed up in 89 everyone lost their mind uh, but now we're getting one a week uh, and they all cost two hundred million dollars. At a certain point, you know, it's going to start. There's going to be it's it's going to be like the westerns. The westerns had a really great run. I think superheroes, like Spielberg says, will eventually teeter off. I don't know when that will happen. It could be another twenty years. But there is such a hunger, and the TV audience, the TV shows that are coming out, prove it. There's a hunger for adult, well written entertainment right. and independent film is that it can be that but there hasn't been they've been they've tried to create streaming services for it specifically but i don't think that's the answer like i I just i don't know what the the, i have an opinion of what the next step is should be for filmmakers like independent filmmakers but there is an audience for it and it is there's no reason why we can't be making money and making careers and building businesses around independent film uh, the 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 ability for it is there. The technology is there. The distribution is there. It's just kind of like somebody has all the parts to the Death Star, but they haven't been able to put it all together yet or figure out how that puzzle goes. Would you agree? Well, I th- yes, and I think that once you expand the focus, not just from the U.S. or North America, to a, a kind of global view, mm-hmm. and and you think about aggregating audiences across national boundaries then you don't have to have that many people in Argentina connected to a movie if you've got people in France and you've got people in South Africa. So, um, you know, a niche can become substantial if you're able to do it globally. Um, And so I think that the frontier is really thinking about 
um, international distribution and how we how independents can make that work. Because right now there's a few people out on that, you know, out in front, but um, there's definitely more opportunities to come. And I also think that curation, which seems to be you know completely underrated. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. You know, the thing about Netflix is that I know at any moment that there's some great films on Netflix that I will never hear of. Mm -hmm. They're there somewhere. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I would love that. I would love it if I saw them but I will never hear of them. And it's, it's true on Amazon and it's, you know, it's true a lot of places. So I think there's a way, I think there's an opportunity for something that's more curated. That's something that's focused on, you know, emerging independent filmmakers from around the world um, where um, there's a kind of uh, the people that, you know, are supporting that there's an element of um, kind of patronage or mentoring, wanting to make sure those people continue to have careers I think there's exciting possibilities there, but the, you know, the major studios aren't going to aren't going to be interested when they can, no. you know, turn out another Avengers franchise. So, um, so I, I remain optimistic. I think that you know, right now, for independent filmmakers, as you were saying before, there's more opportunities than there have ever been. Doesn't mean it's simple, <laughs> um, but I think if they think about how they can build a personal audience. Um, then that's the that's the way to you know try to have a sustainable career. Um, when when I think about sustainability and and it's that's I may sound like a boring word, but I did a webinar a couple of years ago called Sink or Swim: How to uh, Have a Sustainable Career as an Independent, and it was one hour long. I did it with my teammate Keith Alquat, who I wasn't teamed up with then. And uh, over 700 people came from around the world to this webinar. And uh, it was amazing. And with my distribution bulletin, I have 12,000 subscribers. So I don't need the middlemen or women, you know, like giving me permission to reach their audience. Um, So I think that if we can, you know, think about how each, each filmmaker can, she or he can, start to build an audience that they can take with them film to film, that's going to make a big difference. Yeah. And, and that's something I, I mean, I always tell people about niching down. I do believe that a lot of filmmakers will make these broad movies. Like I'm going to make a romantic comedy for a million dollars and it has no stars in it. And uh, let's see what happens. Like that is such a, right. it's just a, you ha- that's like, uh, I'm going to hit a perfect home run. And even then it still might not be able to, to make money where I'm right. always, I'm always telling people to niche to niche down, to find an audience that's more controllable, that you actually have the ability to target, attract, keep that overhead as low as humanly possible. So to make make the movie for as little as you can while still being able to create a minimal viable product for the marketplace and also realize your vision as an artist. So there's that balance that has to happen where right. – a lot. Of, I, I always tell people, I'm like, if someone gave me half a million dollars, I'd make ten movies. Like, I, I'll right, diversify right. my portfolio, you know, because the much better chance of making money that way. Well, I I totally agree. What I say is, what's the lowest budget you can make a movie well for? And and if you and if say the lowest budget is two million dollars, well, don't make that movie next. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's good. I, that's fine. I, Just not next. <laughs> I was in. In San Francisco at a, at a conference of, I don't know, 10 years ago, and I ran into two women, and they were going to make, their, for their first feature, they're going to make this historical epic. Of course. And I'm like, I, I've got bad news for you. <laughs> right now, at your point in your career, there there is not millions of dollars to finance a movie uh, anywhere in the world. So I recommend that you... Think about making a first film that's much more affordable, um, and they they listen politely, and I went away. A year later, same hallway, same two women I run into, and I say, "So what happened?" And they said, "Okay, we um, we were, it made an ultra low budget feature, and we're in post." And I'm like, "That is Smart. that's so great because now they have an opportunity to launch their career." 
Yeah, I I love. I mean, oh yeah, I all I this is my favorite comment. All all I, all I need is five million. That's all. I just all I need is five million. But but you've never made a movie. I I know I know I know. But I've watched a lot of making of documentaries, um, and it's it's isn't it amazing? We're the only industry that I know of that just watches somebody else do it and says to themselves, "Oh, I can do that." I can. It's, it's like you never see a a real estate guy. <laughs> Someone's like, "I'm going to go build a house." I've never built one, but I watch a lot of those shows on on home home TV. But, but yeah, I agree. And but the other part of it is okay. Beyond the question of how good a movie they can make is the question of how much control they'll have if they make it. Mm-hmm. So a $5 million movie, they're not going to have the creative control that they're going to have for a $100,000 movie for sure. And in terms of d- distribution opportunities, they're, they've narrowed them so much. Where are you gonna, how are you going to get $5 million back? You're going to have to give co- total control of your movie to somebody else. Whereas if it was $100,000 or $250,000, you could split your rights have control of your distribution. And um, so people need to think about how they're going to retain control or they're going to be sadly disappointed. I mean, it's it's the slow game versus the, the long game. It's the finite versus the infinite. People are always looking at, uh, you know, I, I find, I, I call it the lottery ticket mentality where filmmakers are looking for these mythical stories. And like, I, I mean, I, if I hear Robert Rodriguez's story one more time, I'm like, dude, that was... T- 30 years ago at this point, he came out in 91, you know, so he's getting close 30 years ago. And these stories of Kevin Smith and El Mariachi and these kind of lottery tickets were just like amazing moments of time where those guys happen to walk in at the right place at the right time with the right movie where nowadays, and I was, I was, I had this disease for many years where I thought the next movie was going to explode my career. I was going to get that million dollar deal. I was going to win Sundance. I was going to do all that. Filmmakers have this kind of mentality that they have to break through from where I believe that it is a, how many movies can I make in the next five years? How many? How am I going to build my career over the next ten years? Play that long game as opposed to I need five million dollars for my epic. <laughs> well, also, I mean, I believe in slow distribution, like slow food. So mm-hmm. I think that with a strategy, you start out with a strategy, you do the first stage of distribution, you learn from it, you modify what you do in the next stage, and you keep refining your strategy as you go based on the results. So you're going to learn what your assumptions are about those audiences, which audiences are showing up, which aren't, how you position the movie, is it working, and maximize awareness in each stage. And ultimately, you can look back on it and say, we did the best we could instead of somebody else you know, screwed it up for us. So I think that if people and, – and there was a time when filmmakers would come to me and they say, I'm just a, I'm just a filmmaker. I'm just a creative person. I don't want to do distribution. <laughs> no, there's not a time. That's the, that time isn't today. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I'm sorry. You have to be meaningfully involved in your distribution. Even if you have distribution partners, um, you have to um, be involved because you're, that's how you're going to learn this, this world and sitting back and going to a few panels. And the problem with sometimes, as you've seen, I'm sure, more experienced filmmakers, they have to unlearn what's no longer true. Mm. as opposed to people just starting out got an open mind tell us what's going on okay great uh, no we did it this way in 95 <laughs> i'm like and then it, here's another dimension that you, you may have run into so um let's see this was probably i don't know maybe this was eight years ago i did a series of um events called uh, Distribution U, where it was just about the newest um, distribution opportunities. And the first one I did was a day-long thing at USC, and afterwards a a nice woman came up to me and said, so I have a a question. I said, yeah. She said, would you do this for attorneys? So (laughs) I just say, on one condition. She goes, what's that? She said that they want me to do it. Because they're also arrogant. And then (laughs) three months go by. I can say this as an attorney. Three months go by, and uh, she comes back sheepishly, phones me and says, I'm sorry that I couldn't find any any attorneys that wanted you to do it. So typically now, because I I see, you know, I don't know, I've probably seen 3,000 deals in these years. And so very 
the norm is an attorney can make a great deal, a great 2013 deal for you. I'm like, well, wait a minute. This is that six years <laughs> that's, ago. That's so fantastic. <laughs> the, the things that you want aren't even in the deal and the mm-hmm. things that you don't care about are in the deal because the deals have changed and what's important, you know, but because they think they know what's going on, they're not like out there trying to figure out what, what makes sense now. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So I think filmmakers need to be really careful, do their due diligence, um, Mm -hmm. not just distributors, but attorneys, reps, whatever, and talk to other filmmakers who are currently or have recently been in business with these people. That's how they're going to find the truth. Mm -hmm. And, um, and even the word, even the, worst bottom feeding distributor is good at one thing, which is telling you what a good job they're going to do with your movie. Mm-hmm. If they're good at nothing else and, and filmmakers, you know, have gotten no love for a long time. And then somebody calls up and says, I'm going to take you to the moon. You know, it's hard for them not to go. for. You're that. so pretty. You're so pretty. Why don't you come out? Let's just go on a date. It will be fine. Right. I promise right. you. It'll all be fine, baby. <laughs> right. It happens. It happens all the time. And you know what? The funny thing is I've noticed that it doesn't matter if it's a seasoned filmmaker or a kid fresh out of film school. They, they all fall for it. They all fall for it because you could be a fantastic filmmaker, but you might not know anything about this side of the business. And that's how these predatory bottom feeder distribution companies, which there are plenty of, take advantage of filmmakers. And it's, I mean, do you agree? I mean, I I find that I I was talking to a distributor the other day and they said, oh yeah, you, you were lucky. You got a check. Most guys don't even get checks. And that was, they didn't even see anything wrong with the statement that they just said, because it's an inherent issue in the entire side of distribution that they're like, oh, it's just a given that you're going to get screwed. It's just a given that we're going to take advantage of you. And that's what I've seen. It's obviously wrong. It's obviously immoral. It's obviously a million things. But isn't that, from your experience seeing so many deals, so many of these kind of bottom feeder, they just, this is just inherent in the the, the deals you get. I got, well, I got a deal the other day from a filmmaker I was consulting with from a big distributor who will remain nameless, and he's one of these big indie ones who proposed proposed that there are for the indie filmmaker, right? And I'm sure you know who I'm talking about. 15-year deal with a $100,000 market cap, marketing cap, for a $50,000 horror movie. They'll never see that. that, He didn't sign it because I told him not to. That's ridiculous. But this is the kind of stuff they they throw out all the time. So I'd love to hear your your thoughts on this. Well, I mean, fortunately, because I've seen lots of deals, uh, seen the experience, I always, whenever I talk to new filmmakers, I'm always like, well, who who distributed your last film and how did that go? And, you know, so I I do know where the bodies are buried. Um, But also... (laughs) Also, um, when I'm talking to distributors, I often find that I know more about what their co- competition is doing in terms of like what's, what's normal in the industry, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And then I love it when they say, I- I'll say, okay, I want the filmmaker to retain the right to sell directly from her website digitally and on, on DVD. And they'll go, um, we've never done that before. And I say, that's great. This is an opportunity to try it. And if it doesn't work, you don't need to do it again. But if you don't try it, you're never going to know if there's an opportunity, you know, there for you. So, um, so I've been lucky because, um, (laughs) I just, I know they, it's not like they're going to say something to me that I'm going to believe that, (laughs) uh, that isn't accurate. I mean, and, and often I can tell them stuff that they don't know about what's working and what's not working. And so, but I think that you have to be really, really careful. Filmmakers should not be distributing for themselves and negotiating for themselves, as you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And then if they're going to have somebody help them do that, it doesn't have to be a rep. It doesn't have to be an attorney. It doesn't have to be a producer, but it should be somebody that really, you know, is living in the present. Um, And, uh, and doesn't have a conflict of interest. One of the problems, and you know, this, with the reps is that okay so the rep (laughs) takes on a movie they may or may not work with this filmmaker ever again but 
they have a great relationship with Sony Classics. Sony Classics makes an offer. So the, the rep wants there to be a deal, but they don't want to have be too adversarial with Sony Classics because they want to maintain the relationship with Sony Classics, which is more important than maintaining the relationship with the filmmaker. So it's just, it's a conflict. I mean, you should be able to use your good relationship with the distributor to get, you know, the best possible deal, even if it feels a little uncomfortable for them, you know, instead of just, oh, yeah. It's like in a former life when I was a public defender, people would go to the prosecutors and then they'd make a deal. And my attitude was, if if the prosecutor wasn't going to, you know, kind of be fair in the approach, I was just going to make their life a living nightmare with motions and, you know, conflict. And so instead of, <laughs> you know, instead of making that comfortable deal, um, you know, I had a way to fight for the clients um, by not, you know, just signing on the dotted line. And I think that um, if people, if filmmakers or whoever that's negotiating for them says, um, yeah, we're really interested in working with you. We, we just want to make a deal that's fair. Now, nobody's going to say, I don't want to make a fair deal. Um, and then I think instead of just taking the boilerplate too seriously, um, you know, they could, whoever's talking to them can come in with a framework. Oh, these are the rights that are available. This is how we'd like to structure it. And then if they don't run away or hang up the phone, then already they're, they're in your framework of what you want. So don't just be reactive, be proactive in terms of, you know, how that partnership could work. And obviously, you want a partnership that's going to be good for the distributor as well as good for you. Um, you want a win-win situation, mm -hmm. um, but you don't want a, you know, a deal that's, that's never, never going to work for you. And it's not just about money. I mean, obviously, money's, you know at the center, but you also want something that's going to work well for your film and your opportunities to, you know, make more movies. And I think that it's so unfair for people to, you know, kind of throw a movie against the wall. They mm. do a bad, bad marketing campaign. Yep. Nobody comes out the first weekend. They give up, but they're not going to give the movie back to the filmmaker because lightning might strike through no fault of their own and it might be valuable someday. So now that you've got somebody's got your rights for seven, ten, infinity years, and um, and you can't do anything about it, and the, mm -hmm. the movie's gone. So I think to think of a not a master slave relationship with a distributor, but a partnership where you're doing things that are going to help the distribution, and they're making right. taking advantage of that instead of thinking of you getting in the way, and they're doing the things they're good at. Yeah, and. I mean, it, it's that whole non non taxable, uh, non tax deductible donation right. <laughs> mentality. Unfortunately, well, but if you also, if, but if you're splitting your rights, <laughs> and you're and you're only giving them the rights that they're good at, and you're keeping your other rights, and you can control your windows, then you really have a lot of control of your distribution, and um, but it could it can really work for them as well. But you've also created a diversification of income yeah. streams, which yeah, is something definitely. that people don't understand. It was like if you go with one distributor and if they don't pay you or go bankrupt or something happens, you're done. Where if you go with four, five, six different distribution partners uh, and also self-distribute and also put it on your own website, you know, then – like I always negotiate with any of my films – I need to have it on my own streaming service. I need to have a control yeah. of it so right. I can rent it, sell it, or use it as part of my subscription. And, and that's you get, non negotiable. And you get the customer data, which you're not going to get any other way. Correct. So, and that customer data is so invaluable. There's, there was a situation. I was in New York, and there was a film I was repping, and um, the, 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 this was the first time I'd run into a distributor saying they weren't going to give the filmmaker the right to make it available from her website digitally. So I'm, I'm walking down, I don't know, Third Avenue, wherever this company was, and I, and I realize I'm in front of the building. So I'm, I'm going in the, in the building, and I'm not leaving until I get this right for the filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So I went up there, and then I got everybody around a big conference table, and I explained. I said, this isn't just about money. This is about her opportunities to make more movies. And the only way she's going to get customer data is by selling directly. And, and I know you – you and I want her to be able to make more movies and that's why it's really important and they said okay 
I mean, it wasn't just, oh, give us a piece of the pie and you'll have less, you know, a smaller piece. So I think that um, it's so important for filmmakers to figure out a way to build, you know, relationships with the people in their audience, mm-hmm. not send them boring updates, um, but send them information they want to receive. Um, be personal and passionate on the website, in the emails, whatever. So they, they, the people in the audience feel they're connecting with this human being that they really want to, you know, nurture and support. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. I think a lot's possible when you take that approach. Now, uh, before we go, I wanted to kind of dive in a little bit to this whole distributor debacle, which is what brought us together in the first place. There you Peter. go. Um, tell me your thoughts on distributor. You wrote, first of all, you did write this amazing article, uh, unbeknownst to me. I I, I found it. Uh, I think. It, it came up on my radar, and then I reached out to you. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta publish this on the on Indie Film Hustle because it's it was wonderfully written, really great information on there. And then um, you put it in the Facebook group. I started protect yourself from distributor, and people started looking like, oh, okay. So, what is first of all your whole take on distributor? And then I'll ask you a few questions in regards to that article. Well, I've known distributor from day one, and uh, for years and years and years. Uh, I think they did a good job. Um, and my, my sense of what's happened is there was like major, major um, mismanagement internally in the last 12 months where distributors thought <clears throat> they had the cash flow to continue to pay people, you know, what they were owed. And then just, just ran into this stark reality that there, the money wasn't there. And their margins were so low that they were never going to catch up. But did um, they take? But did they take? So basically, what happened was that they took money that was residual money that was coming into the bank account and using it to keep the company afloat, and hoping that other money would come in. Because well, that's, they were they were paying filmmakers too. I mean, it wasn't like they stopped paying all filmmakers. And you know, I think that at a certain point. Um, they just realized that they were in an impossible situation. And that, and that, and that, at that point, then I don't know how they decided on the ABC process or the bankruptcy process. Um, they stopped communicating with filmmakers. Um, and so people were in the dark. I mean, I, I know I, I have a lot of clients and I know you had, you were early on the, in the, you know, alert system. Um, <laughs> I was the one that, I, I was the one that yelled it. <laughs> I watched, uh, I watched your, that, that first podcast. And, um, but so many people, even though you, you'd done a couple podcasts, you know, IndieWire had written an article, Variety had written an article, filmmakers would get in touch with me who had no idea. No, of course. It mm-hmm. ha- happened. They were living in, in igloos on Pluto. I don't know. And so what I wanted to do, because some of the stuff on the Facebook site wasn't, wasn't accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the idea that you have to have your film taken down first is not true. Mm-hmm. And um, I understand why people thought that. But then when you realize that Netflix agreed to not require that and to just shift the payee to the filmmaker, mm-hmm. then, you know, that's what we should be pushing iTunes and Amazon and other people to do. Oh, now, absolutely. And now, in some cases, it won't work. And then you get into the taking it down and finding another aggregator situation. But so I just got so, you know, feeling so protective of these filmmakers who were in this situation and had no clue. Then I said, okay, well, I'm going to figure out um, what the steps are. And, it, you know, so the, obviously the first step is to terminate, officially terminate, you know, your agreement. And that's as easy as just sending an email to the distributor saying you're terminated because under the distributor contract, um, if they go to into an ABC process, then you can do termination, you know, immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, so first step is to terminate. Then, um, you know, I looked into what to do about the platforms. And basically if you go to a platform and you, and if you say, um, What's the term? Uh, I just sent this out yesterday to some filmmakers. Um, 
copyright? Isn't it the copyright? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah if you say that um, copyright infringement is happening, um, then they pay attention. <laughs> um, and there's a way to get, I mean, each, each place has a department that deals with this stuff, attorneys and whatever. Um, and then you can, even though, you know, the platforms don't want to deal with individual filmmakers. In this case, it seems to me, because so many filmmakers are involved, and have been affected by distributor, they should make an exception and just, you know, develop a, a kind of blanket system. policy where they could say, okay, we'll just make you the pay and, you know, that'll be it. With Glass Ratner, uh, that's running the ABC. Um, and real quick, can you explain what an ABC is and why they didn't file bankruptcy? Because I think a lot of people don't understand okay. what that is. So ABC stands for Assignment for the Benefit of Creditors, mm -hmm. which is, if you, were a creditor, it's, it's that, BS. <laughs> if you were a creditor, that would sound good. But in fact, in an ABC situation, it's, it's a lot looser, less transparent than in a bankruptcy situation. And one thing we know is the, the company doing the ABC will get paid. Obviously, <laughs> which, is, lawyers, which, is, which is Glass Ratner, right? Yeah, and their lawyers will get paid. Mm -hmm. And then next, what, that, what will happen is the secured creditors will get paid. Mm -hmm. And then and the filmmakers are obviously unsecured creditors, so they're going to be last in line and they'll get pennies on the dollar. If that. Uh, <laughs> so, if that, right. So <laughs> I think that there's an advantage to an ABC um, from the standpoint of a company that doesn't you know, want to go through the – strict process it gives them a little more flexibility i mean i still don't understand why to my knowledge glass ratner has gotten in touch with no filmmaker um, um glass ratner to to my understanding glass ratner has well no as of as of uh, a couple of days ago everyone got this letter from oh, gd abc llc Oh, okay. Well, then not, none of the filmmakers that I'm involved with got that letter. Yeah, this is starting to come out. And, and if you go on the group, the group is actually starting to post, I got the letter, okay. I got the letter, and here's a link. So this is the only official communication okay. to everybody in huh. this, this this debacle is this letter, which is absolute BS. Uh, and it just – when you looked at it, you're like, oh, it's going to take 9 to 12 months. But what I love about this letter is like oh, how much – it says here nine to twelve months. Uh, the ABC is expected to be a nine to twelve month process before any distributions or funds are made. That means that means all the attorneys have to get paid first. Then um, my favorite part is the amount and type of claim. Can you tell us how much we owe you? Well, we can't because you haven't given us the reporting on the back end residuals that you owe us. So how can we? You know what I mean? It's 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 this is basically they're just walking through the the process for legal purposes but this actually means nothing to actually filmmakers getting their film mo the money that they're owed back let right. alone money that they basically stole for service unrendered for, for like myself where i i inv i put in for a client i i put two f films in it cost me four thousand dollars to submit it to the platforms and that's how i was going to do it i had to call my credit card company up and get it refunded by the credit did card you company. get a refund uh, yeah yeah and that's okay. why we started putting it out to people on paypal at six yeah. months in credit cards, it's 90 days, but if you if you reach out and if it's a little bit farther than that, you can go, look, these guys are the, a defunct company. There's fraud involved. They, didn't, they, they took my money and they said they, they didn't do anything. There's other ways of getting your money back, but if you go back farther than that, it's a little bit more difficult. But I was able to get my money back, thank God, right. and I know a lot of other filmmakers have been able to as well. Right. Well, um, the, the other issue is I think that – in the Netflix situation, um, basically, Distribber had a process where they would release the rights um, back to the filmmaker in a kind of simple way. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it was, but there was a policy. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that that happened for um, Hulu or some of these other places. So mm -hmm. then, so then, if you go to the platforms directly. And they ask you, so what's your ID number? <laughs> what's your account number? <laughs> good good uh, question. I have no idea what the distributor account number is. Um, it's a nightmare. It, it's, a yeah. pure, it's a pure nightmare. But also, but from what I understand from filmmakers that I'm working with, only, the only company that has come to the plate 
to try to fix this is Netflix. Netflix is quietly reaching out to individual producers and filmmakers who had deals with them, you know, buy out, you know, SVOD, uh, you know, licensing deals and are doing something in regards to making it right. So if they're owed another $200,000 off their deal and distributor got that money and never paid it to them, they're slowly going to start creating uh, ways of them to make sure that they get their money. Because I feel that Netflix, and they're doing it very quietly, by the way, because Netflix doesn't want the bad press. The other guys haven't even caught on to this yet, but I think someone in the legal department probably said, hey, guys. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. <laughs> so you're saying, you're saying, Alex, that um, Netflix is going to try to make up any monies money that any monies that, that were paid to distribute that wow that's amazing and also change it over to a direct uh, you know yeah, payout yeah, yeah. direct but well, the thing is this and I, I want to ask you this uh, uh, Peter because I think this is something that um, one of the distributors and, and one of the most vocal people on the on the platform brought up originally was on uh, Joe Dane on on the the the, um, the Facebook group was this distributor thing is just a very simple symptom of a much larger problem, which is the entire system of film aggregation and how it runs, where the the platforms have forced film aggregators, or film, excuse me, forced producers and studios, all of them, including the big boys, to run through these five companies. On a technical standpoint, I completely understand it. It's like going to a post house, completely get it. But the problem is that they also force them to deal with the money without any regulation, without any fiduciary responsibility, without any sort of oversight on millions and millions of dollars. Distributor used to, was running, not to hundreds, but probably tens of millions of dollars of residuals probably ran through that company a year based off, because they were net, they were one of Netflix's preferred, preferred vendors. Right, right. Exactly. So how does that make any logical sense? And then also on a, on a legal standpoint, I'd love to hear it from an attorney. Are the platforms somewhat liable for forcing us to go through these companies. I mean, to do business with them. <laughs> okay, well, let's go back two steps. Okay. Um, another, another question, which I think is an important question, is, is aggregation a sustainable business? Not at this point. Um, mm-hmm. And I would say that if you have, if it's part of a, another business, so let's say... Um, Premier Digital. They're a post house or Bitmax. They're yeah, a post yeah. house. Right, right. So in that situation, as long as they're not having to deal, they can kind of automate the process and they're not having to spend a lot of time dealing with individual filmmakers. You know, maybe it's a, a break even situation or they can make a little bit of money. Um, but when people look for a, another aggregator now, um, I'd list it in the in the distribution bill and the qualities that they should be looking for. And one of them is to, you know, get help if they need it from a human being. And, and that's not, um, that's really not an option for most of these places. Um, because they don't want to have the personnel to have to deal with filmmakers when they're, you know, something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. So uh, as to the question of, um, do the platforms have any responsibility I, I don't, I, I don't, I think what, I, I don't know the answer and I mm-hmm. certainly don't know, I'm not an entertainment attorney, so I have no clue if there's some, you know, some way that that could work mm-hmm. because I think what they'll say is, well, we didn't make you go through this aggregator. <laughs> but you make us go through all aggregators. Right. There's only right. five of them. <laughs> and, and, and the other, well, there's, I think there's actually more now. Okay. Um, we could go over that at some point, but, mm-hmm. um, we didn't make you go through this aggregator. You chose to go through this aggregator. Now, in fact, it's interesting. Distributor was a preferred right, Netflix. aggregator for Netflix. Mm-hmm. And then what happened was the Netflix um, filmmakers started not getting money. Mm-hmm. Then they went back to Netflix and they said, mm-hmm. hey, what's going on here? And then that Netflix stepped up and then they actually did something proactively. The other folks, I, I think, are just you know down in their foxholes, hoping that they don't have to do anything about it. Aside from the money, I mean, they just don't want to. They don't want to try to sort it out and 
and then and then guys like myself and you are, are are still making a stink out of this and 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 creating more look if i hadn't released this inform if i hadn't done that podcast people would probably still be in the dark and it'd still be information would be kind of loose all over the place yeah yeah no that's true and that's and you true. know so it was it was us launching this information and this initiative to get information out there to filmmakers right. that we right. even know what any of this it, it, right. it's 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 still disgusting how this company has run this whole there's a, could have, this could have been a very easily dealt with situation. Like, guys, something like, like a public announcement. Hey, we, something went wrong. We mismanaged our thing. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to take care of you guys. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just simple stuff, man. That's simple stuff. It, it doesn't have to be. But there's still, even to this day, still have not made a public announcement. Glass Ratners only cares about themselves because they want to get paid. So uh, it, it's it's – it's fascinating how the, how this company has gone, but I do think that this is a symptom of a much larger problem, you know. And is this a sustainable business model? And are and I always tell filmmakers as well: Is your film a good candidate for self distribution and going through an aggregator? Because if you can't recoup the money that you're spending to get these films up on the platforms through the platforms. And there's no good ROI there. Why would you do something like that? Then figure out other revenue streams or figure out other partners. Yeah, but I think that's complicated because it is. It's it's not just revenue. It's being on a platform. Mm-hmm. So when distributors started out, what was distinguished distributor from anybody else was they could guarantee that you would be on iTunes, mm-hmm. and nobody else could do that. So. You know, being on iTunes was something that people valued aside from the money. Just it's, it's like legitimation. It's a, it's a vanity. It's a vanity it's, platform in many ways. Well, not just vanity, but I mean, I think that in terms of filmmakers' careers, you know, they can say, you know, my film was at that point being on iTunes was you know a big deal. Not a big deal. So I think that I think that the idea of having an alternative. Where you can choose a traditional aggregator where they're going to take 25% and do not much more than the distributor did. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at one point, the distributor was also pitching a subset of their films to Netflix and Hulu and places like that. They weren't charging to do that. And then if they got – if they made a deal, then they would, get, they would get some money, but not a percentage. They would just get some fee. Um, I think then later – They the, charged for it. In the, in the, well – I think later what they did was they said, okay, we'll pitch it to Netflix if you agree to give us 15% if the thing goes through. So I think there was a shift. Um, but also I, I sold one of my my first feature I sold to Hulu through them. And the deal was that I had to pay to get the movie pitched. If they don't get the movie, if they don't accept the movie, then I get a percentage of that fee back. But also there's a 10% uh, cut. Off of the, off of those deals to Netflix and distributor and uh, Netflix and um, Hulu, so that was, but it was constantly shifting. At the very yeah, end, they yeah. were charging twenty dollars for you to get a check. <laughs> I mean, literally. Yeah, I think that once once the, they were on the downhill slide, then they they just kind of try to grab different methods and hoping against hope that they can make it work. But I, I, I one thing I do think though, I don't think there was fraud. I don't think Mm -hmm. there was intentional. I I really believe that it was just gross mismanagement um, because, and I know that, you know, who ran distributor changed over the years, but um, at least in my experience with a lot of filmmakers who worked with distributor, um, I felt compared with other folks out there. And this includes distributors. I think that they were um, behaving, you know, ethically and not, um, cooking the books or whatever. And I think that one of the problems with the dashboard was that it wasn't so much that it was, and I'm sure that at some point it got totally out of whack, but they weren't getting good information back from the platforms either. So it was a challenge where, you know, Amazon didn't send them a report even though there had been money and, you know, whatever. So I think the idea of the dashboard was great, but I think that in the execution, it was, um, it was problematic. So anyways, I think that uh, there's steps that everybody can take. I'm glad that you got a letter um, <laughs> and saying that nine to 12 months until any money's paid. I mean, that's amazing. And I, I, one of my questions would be, is Glass Ratner getting paid monthly? Of course they are. 
Of well, course. Might, they, no, but they might, oh, they might have a flat if, fee. Yeah. They might have a flat fee. If they have a flat fee, but if they're getting paid monthly, then to say nine to 12 months is just. They're milking the cow. They're milking the cow as long as they can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I got to I, I gotta reach back out to Seth. I got to talk to him at Glass Rider and see what the deal is after this because it's, it's pretty insane. Also, you know, I don't know if you know this or not, but the LA Times is doing a very deep investigative report on this. Oh, uh, good. It's very deep, uh, and they've they're going in deeper than any of the other um, other reporting has been done, um, and they're going places that I can't uh, because I don't have the resources that LA Times has, nor the That's legal de- nor or nor the legal department here at Indie Film Hustle. So. Right. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Uh, they're going to be, do- so that's coming out, uh, hopefully in the next week or two. Um, so I've been wow. talking to them heavily as well. So it's, 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 this is an ongoing on story. This is kind of the first of its kind. There hasn't been a film aggregator that's gone down. There's been distributors have gone down, but there've never been aggregators that have gone down. So this is a very interesting, uh, and unfortunate situation. Um, well, uh, I, I, I think Alex, one of the things that I dealt with at the end of my, um, thing was what do people do if, do if another distributor goes under how right. do they handle that and what how to think about it and then what can they do to minimize the chance this will happen to them and one of the things you know i i said is that they really need to pay attention to are they getting the revenue reports on time hmm. are they getting paid on time there are other companies out there who are not paying people now mm-hmm. and uh, and i think that um, as the, one of the lessons from this is if the company's going south and you can get your f- film out from them, mm-hmm. away from them before it goes into an ABC or a bankruptcy process, then at least you have your control of your movie. And, um, it's not, you know, it's not that situation. So I think people have to be proactive and really paying attention. I think some filmmakers, they're like, I, Oh, I don't know if I got paid. I'm like, I don't know if I got a report. I mean, like, what do you mean you don't know? You, you, your email isn't working? You're totally disorganized? What's going on here? Mm-hmm. So I think people have to be careful. I know with a lot of distributors, even though contractually they need to pay, they need to send out revenue reports, they don't. And then you have to call them. And then they'll send out a revenue report. Mm-hmm. So already, already it's your responsibility to – convince them to send you the revenue report that they're legally obligated to have sent you. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then on the question of, uh, auditing, um, auditing is expensive. Uh, you know, with many of the boilerplate agreements, I mean, wh- well, how I think it should read is that if you audit somebody and you find an error of 5% or more, they should pay the cost of the audit. But it's, th- that's not in, the normal boilerplate contract. Of course not. Say. Of course not. Um, but, you know, and and think about it from the standpoint of a studio. I'm not saying what studio, but it's just a, you know, a generic studio. They could write a contract so filmmakers will never make any money. Legally, oh, they won't because of blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Or they could just do accounting so they'll never make money unless they audit them. So in that situation... <laughs> The only people they really have to pay fairly are the people who audit them, which is going to be a subset because they don't want to lose, you know, feel that they're going to piss people off and it's going to affect their career. Plus, they don't want to spend $10,000 on an audit or whatever and audit costs. But, um, you know, in situations when there's a lot of money involved and often auditing is, you know, maybe the only way to go and, and ultimately that can, that can t- totally work. Can I ask you one question? Because you've been you've been in this game for a longer than I have in in the distribution space. What is it? Why? And it might be a foolish question, but why are distribution companies? Why are these contracts so predatory in nature? And how? Why? It, wh- at what point did it start back at, in Chaplin's day? That just like we're just going to screw. This is just a part of the way we do business because it's it's an inherent thing in in all all distributors do it in one way shape or form they well, always i mean it i'm just asking <laughs> well i love it. okay here's the conversation so the filmmaker's <laughs> talking to the distributor who wants the movie and they say 
um, okay, we'll just send you our boilerplate um, mm-hmm. contract, and we can we can we can make you know we can negotiate from there. Okay, so the filmmaker has to understand what they've just said is we're going to send you the worst contract we could dream up in a thousand years. Yes, and we'll we'll negotiate to make it less terrible. I'm like, or, wait a minute, or you're or, or you're or it's foolish enough to sign that one because a yeah, lot of yeah, them would just sign exactly, it exactly, totally. <laughs> so, so what if we said it another way? What if we said, okay, let's just agree on an overall framework in terms of you know, and then let's uh, we'll start with a kind of fair framework and then we'll negotiate within that. Instead of we start with a horrible deal and make it, you know, 5% less horrible. But I, but I also, I think that this is an area where um, if people have somebody helping them who actually knows what's important, right. um, there's a lot of room uh, for negotiation. And one thing that I say to all filmmakers, you should never negotiate by email. You should only negotiate either speaking to somebody, whether it's on the phone or in person or through Skype. And so this goes back to this story. So let me ask you this, Alex. So you, you want to know if somebody's telling you the truth. Mm-hmm. You can just hear them, just see them, or hear and see them. Which of those three is going to give you the best hear, idea? For the hear and see, obviously hear and see no, them. No, no, just hear. Okay. Because... Oh. When you see them, they can do you know kind of clever things, but they can't do the same with their voice alone. You're, wow, very true. So that's why when you're negotiating with somebody, you not only want to know whether they're telling you the truth, but then you can respond to what they say, and you can understand well. In this, on this point, there's no room for negotiation. They're, they're not, but on these other things, there's a lot of flexibility. You, you'll hear that. You'll hear between the lines. You'll know all that information. If you're doing it by email, you, you learn nothing like that. Mm-hmm. It takes forever, and you end up with a crappy deal. So, but I think that, you know, if you, from the, st- and, and I, the other day, I was, I got a contract from a foreign sales company for a documentary, and it was so fair. <laughs> I, I was like, wait a minute, what's wrong with this contract? There's, there's, there's something like, hidden the somewhere. The percentages are good, the territory is good, the term's fair. I was like stunned. Um, and some, I, I know some cases, um, one case with a, uh, a distributor, she paid a lawyer to make the contract as simple and clear as possible. And in another case, I was asked by a company to help them make a fair deal with independent filmmakers. I, who works with independent, with independent filmmakers, filmmakers I, I was startled, and they di- they did. You were the, so, you were the filmmaker whisperer, is basically what I, they hired right. you for. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, but I was really proud of them for you know taking that taking that you know position to begin with. So which is which is funny because they're like, look, we obviously we've been screwing filmmakers for so many years. We have no understanding on how to talk to filmmakers in a fair way. We need you to come in and consult us on right. how to do it. Right. I mean, but, I'm just joking, but yeah. But I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, I get criticized that I'm like anti-distributor. I'm not anti-distributor. There, there are good distributors out there and there's lots of experience of good ways to work together with a distributor. But I'm anti taking advantage of naive filmmakers. I'm anti, um, you know, uh, behaving fraudulently in terms of reporting. I'm anti, uh, you know, using your leverage to, you know, kind of force them to make a bad deal. I'm anti you taking advantage of their idealism and their hope. Mm. Just, you know, I, those things are, and and it's interesting because there's companies we won't name, um, who have been doing bad things for years. Mm-hmm. Filmmakers have been taking them to court and they're still in business. And the only way you can explain that is that filmmakers don't do due diligence because if they did, these companies would have no, nobody that coming to them anymore. They need, fresh, um, they need fresh blood. They need fresh victims all the time. If, right. not the, if the company wouldn't work. But I mean, it's not, I think sometimes filmmakers are scared of doing due diligence. They think that other filmmakers won't tell them the truth or it's too much time or they don't know how to do it. But can I stop you there for a second? Cause I want, I think it's something really important. I think this is something in the psyche of the filmmaker, 
where they might not do due diligence purely because they don't want to know. They don't want to know that the new beautiful girl that's saying that you're beautiful and I'm, I'm, unless we should go out or the new good looking guy that's really interested in you, you don't want to know that they're scumbags. You don't want to know that they're going to hurt you. You just don't want to know. And it's almost like a denial thing because I understand that being a filmmaker, I did that early on in my career at so many different levels in the filmmaking process. And I feel that there's a little bit of that when, when doing due diligence. Well, I think that's true. But I mean, on the other hand, if you've worked four years to make a movie Agreed. Uh, Agreed. And, and you understand that um, this is your chance to make sure um, that you're getting in, you know, in a relationship with a, a good quality group of people, I, I think it's essential. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And maybe it's hard, scary, strange, um, but if you don't do it, I, I can't protect them, and you can't protect them. Mm-hmm. They have to. They have to step up. And this is the whole idea about reactive versus proactive. The, the you know one of the things that really makes the difference between the old world and the new world is that in the new world, filmmakers have to be proactive, making their movies finding distribution, Marketing. building a personal audience, working on their career. They have to be proactive. They can't um, wait for things to come to them. Yeah, I always say you know, the, the, the gods from Mount Hollywood are not going to come down and anoint you like they used to. I mean, those days are gone. I mean, does it happen every once in a blue moon? Sure, but it's so rare. You know, but I mean, I remember when I was coming up, I was I was trying to do things like Spielberg and Scorsese did in the 70s, in the 90s, which didn't make any sense because that window had already closed. And now I know a lot of filmmakers, especially filmmakers of my generation, um, that are still trying to do things like Robert Rodriguez and Kevin Smith. And I'm like, dude, that that that's gone. That is a right. that that window is closed. So right now, we're in this wonderful window uh, that. In 20 years, people are going to try to do things like we're doing now because they are they don't understand what's happening now or better yet, looking towards where this is all going, um, which is, I think, one of the jobs of both you and I to try to at least take a good educated guess on what's happening uh, in, in, the, in the coming years and months. Nobody really knows, but at least we have an idea. Well, I would say, Alex, it's, it's simpler in the sense that, I mean, because – whether it was no budget filmmaker or digital filmmaker or mm-hmm. new world distribution, you know, some people think I have some ability to look forward. I don't think I have ability to look forward. I think I might have ability to see some things in the present more clearly. Mm-hmm. And so I think, I think it's the idea of understanding what's happening now and how things are changing now. Um, that's going to be the most helpful. Um, I don't, you know, I can't speculate wildly about where we're going to be in two years. <laughs> but I do see things. I do see opportunities now, and if if filmmakers, when they're making their strategies, can really um, have a way to test them with audiences, reaching out, connecting with those people, having them give them <coughs> feedback, and they can they can go step by step and figure it out. I'm sure. Um, and I and I think it's exciting that you know in the past it was all about you know going to Sundance and making a deal. Mm-hmm. And now we realize it's it's way more complicated than that. And even the people that go to Sundance and make a deal often end up disappointed. And that, you, I'm sure you've seen this many times, where the official story is this, this, this indie film was a hit. And you talk to the indie filmmakers about what really happened, and you realize they didn't get any money. They didn't have any control. There were so many opportunities lost in the distribution, although it's officially a hit. Um, so I think that people just need to really, um, you know, pay attention and then um, take all that information in and, and go forward, um, both find a balance between realism and optimism. That's right. what I hope they can find. That's exactly. Now, now I'm going to ask you a few questions, because we could keep talking for at least another two hours, Peter. Uh, but I do appreciate you taking the time. I, ask, I have a few questions I ask all of my filmmakers. Uh, all of my guests, excuse me. Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Um, I think it's important to do good networking. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
uh, at one point, a client of mine was going to the Berlin Film Festival, and and I said, okay, from um, the time you land in Berlin until the time you you know get on the plane to come back to Los Angeles, I just want you to be talking to everybody, meeting everybody, you know. Um, and then I said, wait a minute, that's wrong. From the time you get on the plane <laughs> until the time you get off the other plane, I want you to be doing this. So I think that really this the idea of networking in the best sense where you're meeting other people, you know, the idea is that at some point you can help them, at some point they can help you, maybe you'll be able to collaborate, maybe you'll be able to share information. I think that's an essential part of, of making this all work. Um, I, the second thing I would say is <clears throat> when you're choosing projects, um, figure out the movie you have to make that you can't help yourself but make, that you're passionate about making, and not one of 20 projects that you could make. Um, when I, when somebody you know, gets in touch with me about a film, if I have a sense, and then maybe grow out of their own experience, um, whatever, but when I have a sense that that's what's going on, um, it makes a big difference. I'm, I'm way more interested in those movies. And then the third, third thing would be, when you're talking about your movie, don't tell me it's Star Wars Underwater or a cross between Pulp Fiction, Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Tell me what's unique about your movie. Tell me what's different about your movie. Tell me why your movie is something we haven't seen before. And don't describe it based on other movies. And I think that will also increase our chances. And then the, the last thing I'd say is think in terms of teams. Um, you know, it's, an, it's really hard to make a movie. So you've got to find, you know, good teammates that can go through hell and high water with you. And when it comes to distribution, you might, you needed a team to make the movie and you're going to need a team to distribute the movie. And that's, that's not even including the distributors. Um, so you, you need to think in terms of teams and find people that you trust and, and complement or supplement your own skills and experience. And together, um, you can do amazing things. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Well, I don't know if longest is quite the word, but the lesson I learned that I'm never forgetting is trust your intuition. So, you know, over the years, that's, you know, generally how I proceeded. There have been a couple of cases, not even a handful, where I went against my intuition and I paid the price. <laughs> Always. <laughs> and... Your, my intuition, I'm sure your intuition is true, is smarter than my rational powers. Oh. So you, you've got to be in touch with that and you've got to honor it. And, and if you don't, um, you know, you'll be sorry. Now, what is um, the biggest fear you had to overcome when just walking into this business in the first place after being a public defender? Well, there's a backstory. When I was in law school, Instead of <laughs> studying black letter, letter law, I ran a film society. I spent about <laughs> nice. 40 hours a week running the Yale Law School Film Society. Um, we brought Godard, Fritz Long, uh, just a, Robert Mitchum to Yale. Uh, oh, we God. showed two nights a week. Um, we gave grants to filmmakers. We, had them, we did a Russ Meyer Film Festival, the first in the universe. But you were, but you were studying to be an attorney, but yet you didn't realize yeah. that this was the love. Uh, yeah, right. So then when I, and I, when I stopped being an attorney, it was like, okay, what can I do that um, I'm really passionate about? And there's a great book that I recommend to your listeners um, called What Color Is Your Parachute? Mm -hmm. And it's about um, how you figure out, you know, what, what role in the world is going to, you know, make you the most happy and fulfilled and then how you're going to, how you're going to make that happen. So the first part is exercises, which people try to skip over and those are crucial. And then the next part is about how to do networking, um, how to interview people for, um, you know, information, um, how to do resumes and how to do all that stuff. It's a, it's a, it's, there's a new edition every year since, I don't know, the 60s, and it's, it made a huge difference in my life, and I recommend it to everybody. And the toughest question of all, three of your favorite films of all time. Uh, 
Uh, I love Children of Paradise. Ah, good movie. Um, Whatever comes to mind. It, it won't be on your gravestone, I promise. Um, oh, there are just so many. I mean, it, it's just... Um, any three that pop into your head is fine. Well, I'm just thinking of the Criterion movies that I have. Um, <laughs> so I love Blade Runner. Oh, that's one I on love my top. Yeah. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Sweet Smell of Success. Um, mm-hmm. So many great movies. But that's, so, that's... The, so the last thing I just want to mention, if if people are interested, um, to uh, this distribution bulletin, which is how we met. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, if they want to come to the website uh, and just sign up, it's peterbroderick.com. And uh, a couple times a year, um, we send it out. It's free. And um, there have been a, s- a couple issues recently that my teammate Keith has written about how to build partnerships with organizations and and how to um, use conferences as, as the beginning of the distribution for documentaries, which are invaluable. Mm-hmm. So I encourage people to sign up. And that's the best way to get a hold of you, peterproject.com? Yes. All right, Peter, again, we could talk for another hour or two easily, but thank you so much for coming on and, and dropping the knowledge bombs on the tribe and, and really being a champion of the filmmaker, independent filmmaker, for as many years as you have. So thank you very much. It's been an honor speaking to you, sir. And, and it's been great speaking to you, Alex, and you're fighting the good fight, and we all, we all need you on the front lines. <laughs> thank you, my friend. Okay. I really want to thank Peter, not only for – coming in and dropping knowledge bombs on the tribe in regards to hybrid distribution and everything else we discussed in this episode. But I really want to thank him for being a champion of independent filmmakers. Uh, you know, I, I really pride myself in trying to be that for not only my tribe, but for all independent filmmakers. And I have nothing but respect for anyone in this space that really truly is trying to help independent filmmakers make a living doing what they do, which is make films, be an artist. And there is ways of doing it, and we're out here trying to show you guys that there is a way, and you don't, I repeat, you do not have to rely on this legacy film distribution model, the old world, as as Peter puts it, the old world distribution model, because you are not going to be dependent on one revenue source or one company or one person and you're going to put all your eggs in that one basket in hopes that that person or company will take care of you and actually do right by you and actually send you a check and pay you the money that you're owed and without any BS. You need to diversify your income streams from your films as much as possible and to do as much by yourself as humanly possible. And a combination of hybrid distribution, which is part of the film entrepreneurial model of what I created, is one uh, part of this entire method that I created to create multiple revenue streams that can continue to pay you for years to come. And we're going to go much more detail into that in future episodes and, of course, in the new book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, which comes out sometime in November. So, again, thank you, Peter. If you want links, to the articles that he wrote about distributor and how to protect yourself from a distribution company that goes bankrupt uh, and his 10 principles of hybrid distribution in this seminal article in IndieWire. I put those links in the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 358. And guys, if you haven't already, please, 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 please head over to FilmmakingPodcast.com, subscribe and leave a good review for the show. If you get any value out of this, please, please do that. It helps out so much with getting this information out to as many people as possible. And I will also ask you to please share either this episode or the show in general or the website of Indie Film Hustle to as many people as you can, but at least 
five filmmaking friends, five people that you feel that are going to find value in the work that I'm doing with Indie Film Hustle. Thank you guys so much for your support. And again, if any of you guys are going to be at AFM at the American Film Market, I'm going to be around. Please email me at ifhsubmissions at gmail.com. And we're going to try to set up a little uh, get together or uh, I'll be able to sit down with you for a little or coffee or something like that. If I have time, we'll schedule it. I love to meet the tribe. I know there's going to be a lot of tribe members out there at AFM this year. So please reach out. Let's get together. And if, if I can provide any value to you whatsoever while you're there, I'll be more than happy to do so. Thanks again for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 